Well, it was a mission. You know, it was a mission to go and shoot film in one of the most extreme environments that I think f motion picture film has ever been shot in. We commissioned a model of the wreck that was put together to the best of, of everybody's knowledge of what the wreck looked like down to where every railing was bent over and we built the model. We took it with us on the Russian ship on the Keldish and we had a little pre-visualization bay set up where we would take a little video camera mounted on a miniature submersible with miniature fiber optic lights that corresponded to the actual lights we'd be using and we would do dry test runs of the shot and I would get the Russian sub pilots to move their little toy subs the way they were going to move their big subs so that they would understand the shots going down there. We were trying to go down there and shoot narrative film and it was Unbelievable to go two and a half miles down to face that kind of pressure to deal with the kind of technology required to do that and to think you could pull it off, but we did pull it off. And that's pretty exciting. The underwater mirror sub sequence is a combination of visual effects footage involving miniatures, where, which we're shooting, as well as actual Titanic footage, which was uh, shot underwater. Not only do our visual effects have to look good, they have to be perfect because they're being cut right next to real actual footage of these same submarines against the real Titanic. When we actually shoot the submarine, we put special filters on the lens and fill the room with an incredible amount of smoke. The sublights have shafts of light which illuminate the boat and uh, lo and behold, it looks like it's underwater. But when they said we're going to shoot it upside down, it made perfect sense because the model was the dumb object in the, in, in the scenario. Uh, by hanging them off from the ceiling, we could put all the lights on the floor, we can adjust all the lights all we needed. All the motion control system would be sitting on the floor where we needed it. Out of all the photography on the Titanic, those shots are, for me, the most difficult. And I think we even fooled Jim on a couple of those shots. In order to get specifically scripted scenes that we couldn't get at the real wreck, we built a set in a tank in Escondido, California. Well, this is the underwater set of the Titanic as it exists today. So we're trying to recreate the wreck. The hallway you're looking at is the first class hallway that would lead to the first class suites and uh, first class rooms. The majority of the research came from Jim Cameron, who was actually on the wreck. So we have his video from, from when he was actually on the wreck. We've taken that combined with the photographs we have of the actual ship. The first and most important concern is that it's going into a tank so it can't float. Each of these walls weighs about a half a ton. We had to create it to look like it had been underwater for many, many years. So we came up with all sorts of interesting ways of burning and then shellacking and then burning again to try and give it that aged look and the sand, pushing the sand into it as it's drying and shellacking it again to make it look like it had been underwater for quite a while. When uh, I found out that Kate Winslet was uh, cast, I said to Jim, or whoever it was, uh, I would like to meet her. And they said, why? I said, well, I want to see her, uh, her body gestures, her voice level, because I'm playing her. She's not playing me. So we killed a bottle of champagne, and we talked, and we talked. And it was a lovely afternoon. Let's celebrate. <laughs> Cheers. <laughs> Cheers. I thought it was remarkable. I mean, she is a remarkable woman. She's extraordinary. And the stories she has, you know, about partying with the Marx Brothers, and I mean, she's just absolutely incredible. I know it's hard for you to believe that, but it really and truly is not my hair. Uh, the uh, <laughs> breast is mine, the stomach is mine, the <laughs> hips are mine. <laughs> Good, and I hope it's still all yours. <laughs> I loved the time that I spent with her. I hope I'm like her when I'm that age. The reason that we put in this little narrative bit of business where we explain the sinking of the Titanic is so that we wouldn't have to explain it as it was actually happening. And even though the death convulsions of the Titanic were uh, very technical, Jim condensed it down so when it was happening, you'd know exactly what was happening with the sinking of the ship, the breaking up, the stern turning perpendicular, and then subsequently sinking underneath uh, Jack and Rose. I just couldn't think of how you could explain to people what was going on below the water if you didn't already know. I mean, it is pretty cheeky that you're going to show everybody the end of the movie. Not only are people standing in line outside the movie theater saying, why am I standing in this line? I know what happens. But once they're watching the movie, you're going to show them the ending. But the sinking simulation animation, 
I think was critical to an understanding of what's going on in those last few minutes. The lure of the Titanic, especially underwater the way it is now, there's something about it that makes you want it to be the way it used to be. And that became sort of, as we talked about it with Jim, the backbone of the film, because that's part of this film, is that you see it as a wreck and then it essentially comes back to life. The transitions going from the way it used to be to the way it is, or going from the way it is to what it is now, those things were can only be done with the total control of having all the elements at your disposal. So you could pick and choose the camera move for drama's sake, not because you have a limitation. So if you need that control, you need a realistic version of what the wreck is. Well, you need a pristine ship. You need to be able to light both of them and then cross-light both of them as you go through one transition to another. And then, of course, you need computer-generated water, which has never been done. We need computer-generated people. So all of a sudden, you need to create all this technology just to recreate the sensation you have by looking at Jim's footage underwater. We made the decision to only build one side of the ship towards the ocean side of the tank into the prevailing winds leaving the rest of the tank to build Southampton Dock. And in doing so, we ended up building the starboard side of the ship. It forced us to locate Southampton Dock on that side to shoot the whole sequence, but in fact, in history, it was on the port side. So this is this scene only in reverse. And there's the passenger gantry there and just, just everything. Let's see, if I have a scene that takes place on the port side, but I only have the starboard hull, then I have to shoot the scene on the starboard side and then turn the film around mirror image later. So that would be starboard flop for port. <laughs> it gave us a little bit of a brain teaser trying to figure out exactly how to cheat these things so that they would look right. Where were you standing again? Uh, who was on your right? Okay, well, if they were on your right, they're gonna be on your left. And you were holding hands with your right hand, so, oh, and turn your hat around, and it was a nightmare. Uh, this flopping thing, I just haven't been able to get my head around at all. You know, one minute my parting's on this side, the next minute, no, we're flopped, so it's on that side. And it just started to make me laugh when I'd seen men with white star line written across their hats just backwards. I couldn't quite get my head around it, so I just sort of gave up. It's just not something you want to do. But, you know, we saved millions by not building that other side of the ship. We brought in Bob and Denny Skotek to add the ship and dock outside of our green screen pub set and they came up with a pretty economical and effective solution. There was a little bit of forced perspective. We created the shot the way we wanted to look on paper and then proceeded to build everything to fit that look. We felt the best way we could do that was to assemble a combination of miniature elements and painted elements and then enhance it all by adding people in digitally. The ship was a photographic cutout and everything in foreground from that was a miniature in some form or another to the scale that fit to our train. That was sort of like guiding us in which direction that we should go in. In addition to that, of course, the backdrop, the very backdrop of the sky was painted. And I think we did a pretty good job of matching to the full-size set pieces. So we had our big set, but now we had to make the ship sail. And that's where Digital Domain came in. They created and composited literally hundreds of elements into the departure sequence from digital birds, computer-generated water and CG smoke, to background paintings of the pier and the sky. We then added digital people to their 40-foot model ship. And scores of waving extras were shot against green screen in parking lots and placed in the foreground of the shots. All of these effect shots had to blend perfectly with our live action shots of the set to sell the illusion that the great ship was on its way. The real Titanic was a collection of people from all walks of life brought together for one fantastic experience. And that's really what happened with the extras. It was such a great assortment of people. You, had, you know, Irish people, Scottish people, English people, uh, Norwegian, Swedish, and it was such a nice melting pot. These weren't people who were professional actors necessarily, or even professional extras. And they really were people who come from all walks of life and were brought together. And there was sort of this comparison in my mind between the people who were on the movie set as extras, as passengers, and the people who were on the Titanic. They worked together for so long by the end of the film. They had such great heart. They loved coming to work every day. They became like this kind of strange family. What a great week. Thank you very much. You were all fantastic. Third class and first class in 1912, they were very segregated. And in some ways, you did know your place. 
the average American made $500 a year. If you were to sail in the Titanic in third class, it cost you about $33 for a bunk and you would share a room. The most expensive stateroom was well over $4,000. So really, you know, a suite on the Titanic would have cost you eight times the American average income. Part of the story would be about class distinction, so we had to show the luxury and the, the spectacle and the beauty of it. And Jim even went to the length of the stateroom that he had Rose stay in. It was unknown who had stayed in that room. So it wasn't contradicting some historical figure who might have passed. J.P. Morgan was supposed to be, had booked the room and then decided not to sail at the last minute. And it was assumed that Bruce Ismay had moved into it, but that wasn't documented. So as far as we know, it was empty or was available for our characters. The engine room sequence was um, very involved. You know, today, nobody thinks twice about, you know, shooting against a green screen and having it all, you know, digitally added later. But at that time, it was difficult to do digital stuff, so a lot of it was done with the models. And we would do motion control matching and a bunch of complicated things. We did some research, and there was this Liberty ship, the Jeremiah O'Brien, which is an old World War II vessel that had triple expansion reciprocating engines. Basically, like a one-third scale version of the Titanic's engines. So we had some model makers to build one-third scale lights and catwalks, and then we treated it as basically a model shoot. We went into this Liberty ship, we lit it with miniature light bulbs, and we had catwalks, and then we photographed at a slightly faster film rate to sort of give it a little bit more mass. One of the things I learned from Jim is the key is never do the same trick twice. Just when you think, ah, they're doing it with motion control and a background, you change it, and now it's a real engine room, you know, with the Jeremiah O'Brien with its one-third scale engines moving around, and you cut to another shot, and, you know, it's a green screen foreground with a background of the model. If you always mix the techniques up, you're bound for a much better success than relying on one technique for the entire film. We're doing essentially an advertisement for the Titanic. Look how great it is to be in a Titanic. And how do you film a commercial like that now without actually doing it? The audience now is used to seeing these great sweeping helicopter shots as the grandeur of being out on the water. And we photographed the Lane Victory, which is a 1945 ship, and imitated those shots. And then we used that as the basis to animate our motion control camera doing exactly the same thing. It became our animatic of sorts. You've seen a ship on the water before, and this is what it feels like. So hopefully it would make it more realistic. That was the idea of the people. I'm going to shoot vignettes of people that are doing real life things. So hopefully, again, the sum total of what you're seeing, even in the periphery, is something that is real life. And hopefully, at the end of the day, the, your sum total of what you've seen is something that feels correct and feels real as opposed to completely artificial. The first time we came up with the whole motion capture idea, I learned very quickly that even though you could capture the way human moves, it's really the way they move that makes you believe that they're dramatically in that scene. So you have to direct them. It's like, no, you can't just walk. You have to walk somewhere. You have to walk, you have to do something. You're creating a moment in time. Context makes these little vignettes come to life. We started to populate the ship with these people. And once they moved, you got the essence of that personality. It's not generic people. And all of a sudden, you sort of put these souls of these people that you transplanted through this process onto the deck of a ship. Now everybody does this sort of thing, so it's no longer as fascinating as it was. But at that moment that you crossed that bridge and you knew that, boy, anything is now possible, this is now going to change the face of doing this kind of work. It was pretty thrilling, I have to say. We called this the million dollar shot, not only because it nearly cost that much, but because for Jim, it really sold the reality and the beauty of Titanic. We were going for a full on helicopter type beauty shot to cap the scene because it was very important to the story that we see the ship in broad daylight in all its glory. If you didn't appreciate the ship, you couldn't appreciate the sinking. So you had to appreciate it in the terms, in the subjective terms, that people felt about it before they knew they were on the Titanic. You know, it both celebrates the ship and it celebrates Jack's character at the same time, which is what I really love about that scene. It just makes it seem like the idea that you're gonna die, that disaster and doom are, are coming, are so far away and so impossible to conceive. And if you don't start from that place, you'll never understand what it was like to be on, the, to be on that ship. So the question was, how do we do it? Where do we start? We put Danny and Leo on a turntable at Digital Domain. And the turntable and a slight camera move 
exaggerated the move. So when we're coming off of them, that was all done against green screen. And they were then composited onto the model of the ship. And as we pull back to a certain point where we couldn't move the camera anymore, they transition from live people against the green screen into CG computer generated characters. We then had to add all the other elements to the shot. Computer generated water, digital smoke, digital birds, a digital flag flapping in the wind at the stern. Motion captured digital people to populate the ship. And wake elements shot off of real ships manipulated digitally were all combined with our large scale miniature shot on a stage. Pulling the shot off took pretty much every visual effect trick in the book and a few we had to develop ourselves. A lot of these methods are now commonplace in the effects industry. It really was a key moment in the film, both in terms of exuberance of the voyage and the proof of how all the different effects techniques can come together to convey the emotion and tell the story. My favorite set would have to be the ship set, stage one. It was virtually the whole ship. The deck heights were accurate. The width of the ship was made accurate. This thing was enormous. I mean, this wasn't some little set. This was this massive 80-story building on its side. While we built a tremendous amount of the ship, we did not build the whole ship. We were able to eliminate sections of the ship by angling back the camera in a different direction. It was expensive to build the whole thing. So one of the, the things we had to do is we had to reduce the length of the ship. So what we actually did was we, we, we took three slices of 20 foot out of the ship in three different places and just shunt it all together. There is never a shot of the entire thing from end to end complete all at once. And the reason is because it never was. The scene in which Kate was supposed to throw herself off the stern of the ship became the cover set. And it just became a major pain in the neck to, to recreate this scene over and over and over again whenever the weather got bad. Don't do it. Stay back. Don't come any closer. Come on. Give me your hand. I'll pull you back in. No. Stay where you are. I mean it. I'll let go. I could just stay there. Well, you would have done it already. See, the whole idea is to engage her without spooking her. Play like it's not even about her. It's like good swim. See what he's doing, Kate. Yeah, yeah. yeah you I like to play the sort of danger of just being like, well, all right, you know, whatever. Right. It's like walking up to a horse. You have to do it slow. Oh, absolutely. You know what I mean? Also, during that scene, Jim wanted to employ several methods shooting it so that he could, from one angle, shoot down into green screen, and from another angle, he might use a painted backdrop. And then from another angle, he'd just shoot against black. So this scene, which in the film takes place over a few minutes, was shot over several months. Here's an example of how we used a 20-foot study model of Titanic and a miniature video camera out on our potential studio location in Mexico to determine how much of the ship we needed to build and where visual effects would come into play. In this case, we had cars and trucks down below, hills of Mexico in the background, and no ship hull. So we turned to visual effects and asked them to digitally add the ship, remove the cars down below, get rid of the hills in the background, and create a realistic looking shot. In October of 1995, I had my first meeting with Jim. Well, among the first questions was him asking if there was, say, a clothing store on board, um, as a lot of ships do today. The question was, of course, how do we get Leo into a tuxedo? And I actually came up with the idea that maybe you just sort of have Molly Brown take him under her wing. I was right. You and my son are just about the same size. Pretty close. She had a son about that age, and you could just say that she was bringing him a tuxedo, that she'd bought it in Europe and was bringing it home for him. And then he put that in the script. I was able to give him the magic coat that got him in the, the dining room uh, so that he could be with her. You shine up like a new pin. Grand staircase. We're trying to use real oak. So 
pretty much we're actually building this as they built it on the Titanic. We're not building it as a film set, we're building it as a real staircase that can actually take quite a bit of damage with water and things like that. So if you come here, there's this wonderful dome that is over the, over the top of the grand staircase. It's 24 foot in diameter um, and it's all made out of glass and it's ah, a lovely piece. But unfortunately we're going to smash it all. We put it up and we were finishing painting and we were getting pretty near the end and Ken Marshall turned up and uh, I think he almost burst into tears. After 30 years of, of studying the ship so intently and painting the ship so many times, a hundred times, see this thing in three dimensions and be standing here, I am absolutely speechless. I don't know if people realize that we had made it more grand than it really was. People today are just bigger and, and two people could hardly pass abreast of each other on either side of this center banister. So we added about 18 inches either side and it just eased it out and it did look great. This is uh, an extraordinary dress. It was actually um, part of an entire collection that belonged to one woman. We made a very concerted effort to find as many authentic pieces as we could because when people go to do a period film, that you're starting from the ground up, you're starting with the corsets and the underwear and the garters and the stockings, and it's a lot of pieces. It's a tremendous accoutrement of accessories. Actors tend to really like that. As they dress themselves, they realize what it felt like to be that person back then. There's nothing that's been left to chance. Even extras who are in the background that you probably will never see are dressed to the nines. Every single woman has a corset on. Everybody is dressed exactly the way they would have been if they were that character. Part of the luxury of being in a film like this is that you basically just have to put on the clothes and walk on the set and you're there. The dining saloon is per perhaps the most phenomenal interior set. The fact that that was reproduced the full width of the room. Oh, you walked in there and, and you just had the sense you were on the real ship. This is actually the dining room. Uh, this is actually going to go on our tilting platform. We're going to see this in two different situations. The first one is they're all, everyone's doled up very, very nicely in their first class attire. They come down, they have a meal. But then later on, we're actually going to have to tilt this thing and drop it 30 feet into a tank of freezing cold seawater. Every prop had to be made. Cutlery had to be found of the right design, glassware, the tableware, everything. The carpet in the dining room all came from the original manufacturer BMK Stoddart. They still had the old designs and uh, you know they, it was all specially woven for us. You have all these wonderful heads over here, all these fantastic details we made out of plaster. It's also accented with some wonderful stained glass windows which produce a really really nice set. Lovely boat, shame it went down. Be Mark. The thing about the dinner scene and even the lunch scene they're incredibly tedious to do. You just have to do them over and over again, and they're, you know, they've got to co cover every actor, and so there are 10 people at the table. i got the air in my lungs and a few blank sheets of paper. Got air in my lungs and a couple blank sheets of paper. Got air in my lungs and a couple blank pieces of paper. Got lungs in my air. <laughs> what was my line? Air Sorry. in my lungs. Got air in my lungs couple blank pieces of paper. What's really great about this group is that there are a lot of very silly people and we, we have a lot of laughs and we just try to keep laughing. I wrote a little song about it. It goes like this. To make it count. Cut. 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 surrounded by people dancing fast, some of the dancers have to come on the, on the camera side of them, which means that when you pull her out, Leo, you have to pull her out to here, uh -huh. okay, yeah. to give room for yeah. them to go by. My favorite scene was dancing in steerage. I just had a blast. It wasn't about water. It wasn't about anything else that had anything to do with the film. It was just fun and silly. And I got to be relaxed much more. <laughs> I didn't have to look so pristine the whole time. I didn't have people fiddling with me and keeping the makeup perfect and, you know, keeping the wardrobe perfect. And also it was, you know, watching Leo dance, I would happily pay good money to do again. It was very funny.
there's something about putting the corset on and getting into the period clothes that I feel that it does all the work for me. And it gives me a sense of what the, the women back in the early 1900s had to deal with because it's impossible to take a deep breath. Half a lungful, oh, hello. There's something about the restriction that is uh, very um, appropriate. It was true at that time that women could not dress themselves or undress themselves. They couldn't even take their own hair down without help. I mean, it was an hour process getting dressed for dinner with the help of one or more maid servants. I mean, it was just crazy, the stuff that they did. The character of Rose was um, born into this sort of very claustrophobic, high-class situation with the wealth and the expectations and the limitations on what a young woman could possibly hope to do with her life. She was basically a chattel to be traded for the benefit of the family. And so they're these creatures of porcelain beauty, but they're not in control of their own lives. <sighs> it's so unfair. Through Jack's inspiration, she was able to break free of that and kind of become a model of the 20th century woman. Hi, Jim. Some ideas for scene 93, the tea scene. I'm going to play the mother, and this is Ellie. Um, just to remind you that, that everything the mother does should really be very small. All the corrections that she gives the child should just be done, you know, in a, in a minute way. It doesn't need to be huge gestures. She could remind her to put her napkin on her knee. Put your napkin on your knee. All right. Um, how about fidgeting is a good one. With a, with a spoon in the teacup. Give it a little tap. Fidget, fidget. Thank you. And I think a good one is a slice of cake, how to, how to eat cake. Um, and I think the best type of cake to have will be one that's sliced down like this, like a sponge cake, because it's much easier for, for you to cut with a fork, which you would do. So like any normal child, she could go to pick it up with two hands. Might you do that, Ellie? Can you do that? And the mother can remind her, ah, uh, use your fork. And she would slice it and eat it daintily. And that's it. The boiler room was a fun set. This was, again, using a little bit of the old, uh, old movie magic. Obviously, there's so many boilers, and the actual big Titanic boiler room went on forever. We only built two and a half boilers, uh, and then stuck a mirror on the end. So it looked like the boilers just continued on and on and on. So you were able to look into the mirror, and lo it looked as if the boilers repeated all the way down through the ship. It was a, a fun bit of movie magic. Jim's thing to me, he wanted Dante's Inferno. And I think we really got it because it was hot and sweaty down there. And I think the stokers had this kind of great patina and sweat on them. And suddenly all the, the coal dust started to settle. And, you know, you had the, the real look. And uh, it, was, it was great. The models that contained the flooding were shot outdoors because there was a lot of water involved. We had a rig built where it was like a ball with like a fire hose nozzle hooked up to it and that was pulled through the hole. I think we hooked it up to somebody's car or something like that to pull that thing. When that shot went off, it looked so real. When we saw it in dailies, we were just amazed the way everything blew in there, and that was a lot of fun. To create the interaction between our main characters and the iceberg, we dumped a load of ice down a chute on the deck of our big set using a motion control camera and a big piece of green screen behind the set. We then shot our miniature iceberg with the same camera move on a motion control stage with interactive lighting from the ship's windows. We then created digital falling ice pieces to bridge the full scale and miniature elements and composited them together into the final shot. For a subsequent shot of the iceberg moving alongside the ship, we started with a live action plate shot on our big set and then added our iceberg model, augmented with lighting effects coming from the ship's portholes, real ocean water and foam elements for the wakes, and various splash elements to create the necessary water interaction. The boiler room was just incredible. You couldn't find a bad angle to shoot the set at. Shut that damn pot! But 
it wasn't designed very well for the flooding sequence because they had no capacity to relieve the water once it poured in. So we just shot this thing as the events were happening and each take we did, it got more and more deep. Another set where it was decided that it was going to be too expensive, vastly too expensive to, to build it, was the First Class Lounge. We knew that we also needed a miniature where we could actually show that whole room being submerged underwater. If we eliminated building the set and shot against a green screen, we could put those performers into the model as if they were actually in the room. At quarter scale, you can get a lot of realism. It basically relied on our miniature to pick up all the slack. I was really happy that they felt that our miniature was good enough to be used as those kind of backgrounds. During the shooting of the third class area, when walking through all the corridors and moving everything around, you'd almost get lost. You know, everyone was going for craft services and they were gone for two hours because nobody knew where they were and they're all walking around with sweets in their hands, you know. The set definitely did that. Even though it was huge and it was a huge, you know, ship, Still, in the steerage, it was small and compact. It was really claustrophobic. You can't go up there. You can't do this. And you'd almost believe that if you were in that situation as the water was flooding, it would have been a horrible, horrible place to be. The lights would have gone out. It would have been dark. You would have been lost. You wouldn't have known where you were a terrible, terrible situation to be in for anybody. Even when we're shooting it and the lights went out, it was scary. Imagine the actual real thing happening. Not very nice. This is the ending dress for the big chase yeah, around the bows, the chiffon ombre. The water dress, as we called it, was probably the biggest design challenge in the movie. The dress had a tremendous amount of layers to it, and it was silk chiffon that had been ombre dyed, which meaning it changed colors. It's a very, very complicated dress to make, and I think we probably ended up making about 24 or so of them. I think it worked out really well. I was quite pleased also with the way that it functioned when it was dry, and there's that wonderful slow motion shot from behind, and you see Kate in the dress is kind of beautifully blowing in the wind. We knew that the dress had to be able to be shown in the water and still look good. Don't worry, Jack, you're not going to drown. <laughs> it's going to save you a lot more. The logistics of her getting around the ship and being underwater and swimming, and I'm sure Kate hated that thing after wearing it for months and months. That water was so cold. I think it was about 60 degrees, and um, everybody else was in wetsuits or dry suits or something, but I can't wear anything underneath that costume because, by design, Jim has always wanted it to be as though I'm naked when it's wet against my legs. Um, so, of course, you know, there's no room for such joys. It wasn't just building the set. It was building all the stuff to shoot and light the set that was adding a layer to it that we hadn't really anticipated, that all the normal Hollywood lighting tools and photography tools went out the window. Right. The real issue is going to be having this be variable height. So I thought, well, what about a crane? The big construction crane with a big boom, a big jib crane on a mobile transporter, essentially. So we can move the crane up and down the full length of the set. What happened very early on in the shooting of the film was that the tower, which was basically a large construction train on a track, was liberated by Jim when he realized that he could hang a camera from under the tower and basically get pseudo helicopter shots of the entire ship. Really became a, a really beautiful camera platform. We definitely got shots that we never would have been able to get otherwise. We're seeing here are boats 9, 11, 13, and 15 leaving in pretty quick succession. And for a lot of the steerage passengers, this is their last chance to get off because after this, they're going to have to head way down to the bow to find a boat that hasn't left yet, maybe not even get there in time. And so people are just scrambling into the boats and getting away. And these boats are pretty much the most full. 
action. Boat 11, which is caught with the condenser discharge, is trying to row away while 13 is coming down almost on top of it, right behind that. And just about the time that uh, 13 hits the water, 15 will be coming down on top of that. And the wash from that discharge washes 13 aft right underneath 15 to the place where the passengers can reach up and touch the bottom of that 15 coming down. And they were panicked. They didn't know if, if they could hear them. But fortunately, they were able to release the falls on 13 just in time to row out of the way. And then 15 came down right where 13 had been just moments before. Can you hear me, Jim? They should be able to stand up and touch the bottom. And it shouldn't be really much lower than that. Thanks for your opinion. Now I'm going to make it exciting. set up with these hydraulic cables and raise it right up till it's flush with the top of the tank. And then with all that water volume underneath it, they can then start to lower one end and just sink the whole thing. Oh my God. So that's the theory. Now, no one's ever <laughs> done gonna... this before. They keep telling me it's going to work, like but... like a one-shot deal? Or... No, it can't be because we have, have so, much, we have so much coverage to do in here. Lower the set, Scotty. Okay, we're lowering the set, Josh. We're lowering the set. So put it back to the to, uh, yes, sir, to, to the starting level. Reset, please. A lot of the water stuff has been really rough just because I'm really temperature sensitive. I gotta get heated up. Oh shit! This is cold! To act when you're freezing is hard to concentrate. Please! Please help us! Please! All right. You have to lunge up like this to grab that light, and that puts you sort of up out of the water. That'll look fine. We built the first class smoking room set with all the great wood paneling, beautiful fireplace, and the painting above for the scenes in the film where Cal socialized with the other first class passengers. Since the set was built primarily for the early pre-collision scenes, we built it level on the stage. The irony is that in order to make it look tilted for the later scenes with Victor Garber, we had to tilt the camera and then have the actors lean to one side. We also made props like wine glasses and shot glasses with the correct tilt built into a solidified gel. We then used string to pull the glasses off the mantelpiece, which coupled with the tilt of the camera, completed the illusion. And to show the ship actually sinking, we had to adjust the ship to a six degree angle. We then disconnect the front 180 feet of the ship and put it on hydraulic cables that will raise and lower it. And you will actually see the front section of the ship on camera go underwater as the water pours up on actors. 
I think that people need to remember that a lot of what you see in this movie is real people running along a really huge set. Though visual effects might have added a component into the set, basically it's 90% the real deal. Yes, this was back in uh, 96 and 97 when we still did things with real people and real sets. We designed a series of visual effect shots to take advantage of the big ship set in the later stages of the sinking. By filming a lock-off shot of the tilted main set, which didn't move, and a second shot of the sinking set, we could have ILM digitally combine them into one shot, creating the illusion that the entire ship was sinking while still seeing all of our actors and extras running around on deck without having to use a model or digital people. Since our big set was only tilted at one angle, six degrees, we tilted the camera to make it look as if the ship was at a steeper angle. Then, digitally added a new waterline and horizon to disguise the extra camera tilt. We had a full-scale, 40-foot truck tank painted up like a funnel that we dropped on the set to create a huge wave to swamp our lifeboats. But we also needed some wider shots with a miniature funnel falling behind and even on some of our characters. The funnel that was used was 14 foot tall, order scale, and the plate that we got was a, a full down view minus the funnel in which there was a long, thin splash in the water that was accomplished by a line of primer cord that was detonated in the water. So we had to retrofit our cable to hit that exact spot. Fabrizio uh, is the one that gets nailed by the smokestack, and, and there's a whip pan away from him towards this smokestack, and the live action, there's nothing there, it's just black. The problem with the model was the weight. It was up in many hundreds of pounds. We solved some of the weight problem because of the fact that we weren't using any metal other than the framework. Parts that uh, would come close to the camera were done with show card, basically cardboard that was painted. And oddly enough, the texture of the show card when it was painted had the same exact feel as the metal would have. Uh, there was a little bit of nervousness the first time we did it because we really didn't know how far it was going to fall, how hard it was going to hit. Everybody okay? Yeah. We did it several times, and when we did get it, this felt really good because it was all in camera. There was nothing else that needed to be added other than the first part of the shot. Digitally, now it's what's really good is being able to take these two separate pieces of film and put them together and make them seamless. We're talking about, Charlie, 60 degree water? 60 degree. 60 degree water. Long-term exposure, again, we have to watch out for the hypothermia. I don't think you're going to have to tell anybody to get out of the water, John. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll be forcing you out of the water. The water's going to come up, follow that post up. Yeah. Roll cameras. And action! Say the dome cue three times. Okay. So they get it absolute. Action! It was a lot of fun. I think our model was probably about 20 or 30 feet long. Even to this day, when I show people pictures, they think it's a real hallway. I said, no, it's only quarter scale. That was a really a challenge, because it's quite long, and we had to create all these wall panels out of balsa wood and fix them so that they would break realistically. 
We had some very large drop tanks created that we could uh, drop water and flood it into these things. The camera zipping through there, it was just amazing how fast that camera went through that set. And I was very leery about pulling the camera that quick. Speed! Speed! Yeah. did this great miniature shot, but Jim didn't think it was quite working when he first saw it until he rotated the shot in editing so that it was tilted. And that made all the difference. For the jumps, when we had up to 40 people jumping off in one single shot, what everyone thinks is, oh, we had this ship, and there was all this water, and it was deep water. Actually, there was only a small area that people could actually jump. For most of the tank, is only three foot deep. And we had a trough area that went out 20 feet from the side of the ship. And background and action. We had either dummies floating in the water with their life jackets on, or we had deck chairs made of rubber, so people knew where they could jump. It was very important that when someone jumped, that wasn't the end of the shot. They needed to, to sort of swim to safety, so the next person could jump and there was no risk of anyone landing on top of anyone else. We've got the cut. Let's hear it for the stunt team, folks. Let's hear it for the stunt. We're currently on the poop deck of the Titanic and it's a section that's been made that can actually lift to 90 degrees. And so what we've got, 150 extras and 80 to 90 stump people that we're just rehearsing on this section just so we can get it to look very realistic. The idea is to create the illusion of danger but having it safe. There was a lot of safety parameters that went into it. They all had to be cabled, obviously. We had to make sure that everyone was wearing protective pads. The worst thing that can happen here is that people are going to land on top of each other. So we've all got to be prepared and know exactly where everyone's intending to go before we start. We put human-shaped dummies that were completely foam around certain objects that couldn't be made of rubber. Some of the stump performers would carry these dummies down with them. We made a lot of things in the end out of rubber, or coated things in rubber or foam, so that people could actually hit things and bounce off. We did most of the tumbling down the deck at 25 degrees. That's where the stunt performers could still control to a degree where they went, and they wouldn't get really hard impact. The section that we were shooting over was over 400 feet long and we basically had to get people from one end to the other end and make it look as though they were sliding very fast and the ship was only at six degrees. We had to make it look as though people were at a 45 degree angle and sliding down the deck. And we had people on cables, weighted cables, and we'd made these very, very small sl like sleds or sledges with uh, very small casters on. Once the cable pulled you, and it would pull you very, very fast, it would release. We'd had a release mechanism built into it. But then you could actually spin 360 degrees. It actually worked very well. Very early on in the prep of Titanic, I got together with Rob Legato, the visual effects supervisor. And we were going through sequences where it was impossible for stunt performers to actually do these things without seriously getting hurt. When it was pitched up in the air like it was there, it's 300 feet in the air. A stuntman can't fall that far into water and not break his leg, and that became part of our mission is to do these digital stunts, which are now very common, but back then were not very common. We did lots of tests with Rob, like we had people fall off 40-foot or 60-foot rostrums into airbags. We shot with two cameras and basically did our version of motion capture, which we called it roto capture. He would then test it to see if he could use it for some digital stunt people falling down the set. At the end of shooting, we put on these black sort of like skin tight suits with all these balls and we did things like fall off 20 foot sections, hit rubber, mats, bounce, twist, somersault and we were those CG guys, so to speak. But when we were doing the falls on the poop deck, which we only had 100-foot sections, some of those shots you're seeing a 200-foot section. 
at some point, the connection with the rest of the ship, we would have to do sort of a digital set extension and a digital stun extension for that. So the falls would all start for real, and then CG guy would take over, because we, we would actually come to the end of our fall or the end of our cable. I think the combination of the two worked out extremely well. As early as late 1995, nearly a year before we shot the scenes, Jim already had a very clear picture in his mind of exactly how to show the splitting and sinking of the ship, shot by shot. We used models and storyboards and all sorts of really low-tech tricks shot with a miniature video camera to build complete video sequences called videomatics. With the videomatics, we could show the visual effects companies exactly how we wanted the sequence to play. All they had to do was to look beyond the handheld shaky camera work and funky shots to see the grand and emotional sequence Jim had in his head and was ultimately able to put on film. What we're doing, we're sinking the damn ship. And right now there's a break area that's been pre-scored and there's lead plating over on the side. And what we're featuring right now in this particular angle is uh, the actual rip, where it actually separates and, and opens up the, uh, uh, the side of the ship. So this is probably going to end up being about like one second of screen time. But. Cut! We're checking now, see if it looks good. We're holding our breath. Oh, it looks great. The camera looks great. Let's see D camera. That's great. Oh, yeah. Okay, let's do it again. Um, put it back together again as best you can. Uh, no explosions. And just let it rip. For the one sequence where the poop section went up to 90 degrees, we try to do as much with the actors as humanly possible and, you know, again, safety allowing. But I've got to say, you know, both Kate and Leo were excellent. They weren't scared of heights. We had them 80 feet in the air and they were cabled, obviously, but, you know, it's a long way down. What's happening, Jack? I don't know. I don't know. For the stunt, we had small platforms that would bolt into the floor we used machines called fan descenders, which are a big cylindrical drum shaped like a cone, so that when people dropped, they would start fast, and then they would decelerate so they could actually land on their feet on the ground. But we had 10 descenders working, so we could drop people a whole 100 feet, and on the way, they would hit someone else, who would then fall, hit someone else, and they would fall onto the uh, platforms, whereas our key people on the decelerators would fall the whole 100 feet to the ground below. We designed some really challenging and memorable shots to sell the height of the ocean liner standing on its end, its stern hundreds of feet in the air. Everybody on the show called this signature tilting shot the toilet paper shot. Why? Because we used a roll of toilet paper on the set to give the cameraman a reference of where a falling digital stuntman would be added later. We then turned the footage over to Digital Domain to track and add the rest of the elements to the shot. I'm Judith Crow and I'm one of the supervisors on Titanic. And this shot here, you're seeing the result of a three-dimensional track of the plate so that we can work out the camera move and pass that to other animators to put in stars and ocean and a set extension to extend the ship into, further into the image. And there's actually a toilet roll dropping through shot which would be replaced by a CG falling body and a very dramatic shot tilting all the way down from the tip of the stern of the ship all the way down to the ocean. The final moments of the sinking were achieved through a combination of both old-school visual effects methods and new digital techniques that were groundbreaking at the time. We built a quarter-scale miniature of the stern and poop deck, then shot it with a high-speed camera as it was lowered into a tank. This gave us our main background with the necessary water interaction. We then added digital extras reacting to the rising ocean with mats for when they would disappear beneath the churning water. 
We also added digital mist elements to blend the digital extras into the miniature shot. Finally, we shot a green screen element of our actors on a full scale section of the railing and composited it all together and even added a digital camera shake. We shot Kate and Leo and various stunt extras in front of an underwater green screen, which was set up in a small tank in Rosarito at the very end of production. We then combined these elements with a miniature ship element, as well as various bubble passes, both real and computer generated. The idea of putting the stern of the ship in the background of the shot came late in the editing process, but really helped sell the scale of the event. Due to delays in building the outdoor set, we ended up shooting the ending scenes of the movie with Jack and Rose in the water very early in the schedule in a four foot deep indoor tank with an artificial horizon. Once you get in there, we'll try some stuff, you'll start to get comfortable with it, then we can become a little more animated. The other thing is, conserve your energy, don't go crazy on the first two takes. The performers were forced to crouch down to create an illusion that the tank was deeper than the four feet that it actually was. We added a whole lot of breath signature visual effect shots because we were unable to get the breath signatures on set that we hoped for to sell how cold it was the night Titanic sank. If we refrigerate the stage, we can't heat the water. Because if we heat the water and refrigerate the stage, we're going to get steam coming off of the water. And we came up with the solution of adding digital breath. And a good hug. What we're doing is we're shooting the breath element in such a way that all we see on the film is the breath coming out of the person's mouth. The person is behind a black mask and all we capture is just this delicate breath material going by. The room's chilled with these big air conditioners. It ranges between 42 and 48 degrees. And we need to composite that on top of those uh, actors. It's about 100 shots, roughly. It just makes it look like it's actually there. We're volunteer guinea pigs. We've duplicated what the extras will be wearing, and we're trying to determine what's a safe period of time for them to be in the water. We're asking the people to do it, so I thought if I couldn't do it, why would I ask anyone else to? We determined from this test that our extras could safely spend several hours at a stretch in our unheated outdoor tank. The tank was very cold. If you're going to be in a tank for 11 hours, it's not so nice. Yeah. <laughs> we provided warm water hoses and hot tubs to help the extras stay comfortable. The extras were so dedicated. They were such troopers, even when playing dead. Great job, everybody. This background is the best in the world. Thank you. Yeah, let's work for yourself. Let's hear it for everybody. You're great. The dead makeup was amazing. I did get uh, my hair done up with wax in it. After that, they put spirit gum with these little crystals of gelatin that were very hard when they first were applied. But as soon as they were sprayed with mist or, or got wet, they expanded. And so you had all this gelatin-like stuff on your face. I, I like that one. That was not an attractive look. <laughs> Ken Marshall's paintings were amazing. I mean, they were the Bible for Jim. One of Ken's beautiful paintings is the Carpathia and the lifeboats going towards it. 
So the job was to recreate that shot. The lifeboat sequence with the Carpathia was the only time we went on the open water for any of the period filming. You don't realize how difficult it is to do something in the actual real ocean until you go there and do it. Ready and rise. Just to row a lifeboat next to each other in the open ocean, and not only two, but three or four, and you realize this is what it was like for the people in the lifeboat right after the Titanic sank, just drifting in the ocean. Um, after the Carpathia arrived back in New York and the uh, passengers came ashore, the unsinkable Molly Brown, as she was later known, commissioned these medals to be awarded to the Carpathia's captain and officers and crew just out of appreciation for, uh, for the rescue and for uh, just expressing the survivors' gratitude for everything that was done on their behalf. How you end a movie is so important, especially when you have a love story in which your main characters don't get to live happily ever after together. The challenge is, how can you create a hopeful beat when most of your main characters die tragically and do so 74 years before the ending of your movie? I think one of the keys to the film's success was that Jim was able to create an ending that in one shot turned what could have been a bittersweet, tragic ending, a real downer, into something beautiful and emotionally satisfying. Jack and Rose coming together was exactly how Jim had scripted it from the very beginning. It was the longest single shot in the film, but it was filmed in a lot of pieces that had to flow together seamlessly. We shot all of Rose's photos with a motion control system so we could fly this big camera very precisely from one picture to another, moving very close over Gloria Stewart's face. We then transitioned to our 20th scale rec model, where we really wanted to capture the feeling of artist Ken Marshall's paintings. This was the handheld pre-visualization pass where Jim worked out the camera move. From there, we transitioned again to a larger scale promenade deck model in both wrecked and pristine states, and finally morphed to Jimmy Muro's Steadicam shot going into the grand staircase set with all the actors. It was kind of like a theatrical curtain call. James Horner wrote a song. It's called My Heart Will Go On. And it's a beautiful, beautiful song that goes very, very well with the movie. Through the whole movie, it's only music. All the songs that are being played in the movie, it's only music. And it's the only song, singing song with words. So I feel very honored that they have chosen me. It is very different for me because I don't feel like it's a video set. I, for the first time, I feel like it's a movie set. Having green stuff behind me and they have built a boat for me. Oh, how lucky I am. <laughs> is my boat ready?